Hi, I'm Mitra. I'm a licensed tour guide in Italy and I'm also a virtuoso travel advisor. Today, I want to give you a brief introduction to one of the Roman ruins you unknowingly walk by on your way through the big long road to the Colosseum. Welcome to Trajan's Markets and Baths. Let's go. Emperor Trajan's markets are the most famous for Trajan's Column, a victory column erected after his first century AD victory over Dacia, also better known as Romania, today. The column is something that you would get if you did not qualify by the standards to get an arch, a victory arch, or what we call a triumphal arch. The column, however, is full of very detailed relief sculpture. If you unfold them, they would be about 120 meters long, almost 400 feet. They would have been painted in glorious colors. Inside the column, there's a staircase where the victor would walk inside and emerge on the top, dressed in all his fine regalia, greeting the crowds below. Today, with Rome having become a papal city and more prominently so during the 15 to the 1700s, there is a statue of Saint Paul up there. Emperor Trajan is then going to proceed to build what in the 20th century become named Trajan's Markets. It was over 150 shops and the main street was called the Bibarium, from the Latin biber, which means to drink indicating that there were plenty of establishments to go buy drinks. And this is also where a lot of historians suggest that the Romans went and got their food ratios as well when it came time for those during Roman history. Now these types of markets that we have here would have operated on a two-level type of system. There were shops all the way on the bottom floor, there were food markets, food courts if you so will, and there were also public restrooms. And on the top floors we had offices for rent because most of your senators didn't live full time in the city of Rome. They lived outside of Rome up towards the mountains of the south of Rome where the wine was growing well, the views were spectacular but also protective. You could see armies coming from a mile away but above all also you had more space than you would have had in the crammed hot city of Rome. So they will rent offices temporarily, there's also apartments for rent on the second hand floors. Essentially what he builds for you is the first shopping mall of Italy, if you so will. So if you're a fan of big shopping malls, you can probably thank Emperor Trajan for that. Emperor Trajan also has baths. Baths were a big deal. So you can see behind me over here, you see the bath structure in the way back. The Emperor Trajan's Bath was one of the bigger ones ever built in Roman times. The biggest ones we have in Rome are the Baths of Caracalla. But Trajan's Bath could pump out a total of 8 million liters of water per day. Thousands of people could churn in and out of these Roman baths. In a society so completely obsessed with hierarchy and social structure, the bathhouses... The baths were a big deal in ancient Rome. Romans are quite into personal hygiene. This should be evident to you first and foremost when you look at Roman statues. For being some of the, shall we say, most well endowed on the body hair department of Europe, the Roman and the Greek statues have surprisingly little body hair. See, the Roman men were quite into waxing. And gentlemen, when I say quite into waxing, I mean every bit, every pit, every nook, and every cranny. We wax it all from head to toe. And this is why your statues look quite as smooth as they do. There's a very logical reason for this. We don't invent soap in the Western Hemisphere until the 6th century AD. So we essentially use perfumed oils to wash our bodies in these bathhouses and they get scraped off with a metal scrape. If you have body hair, that is going to hurt if you go through that. So we want as little body hair as possible. We do have baths for men and women. We don't quite often mix them. They have their own separate times or even their separate days to go in through. But we also have the full works in the baths. We have entire libraries attached to the baths. We have gyms, we have swimming pools. These baths are also then divided into a hot room, a tepid room and a cold room. The hot room is the caldario, the steam room, if you so will. Then to temper the transition from hot and cold, you go into the tepidarium, the lukewarm room. And then you go into the Frigidarium, where there's an ice-cold plunge bath about 8 degrees Celsius. There are still a couple of spas in Rome that recreate this experience if you want to do it. You can sit in a steam room and they have a plunge bath inside there. And then they have a tepid pool outside as well. 
All of this is to create circulation. It is for good health. The Romans were really into spas and beach resorts, one of the most famous ones. Shall we say the Cabo San Lucas of ancient Rome would have been Herculaneum. So in these baths, you can also go to the library, you can get your personal trainer on, you can get your hair or makeup done, you can get ready. But perhaps most importantly, why the baths became so popular? That in a society so rigid with social structure, in the baths, everybody were welcome. So you as a high-ranking noble politician could share a bath with a freed slave. Women shared them with wives of senators or household slaves. And this means that this was also a breeding ground for gossip. And in Rome, your reputation was everything. Caesar even had divorced one of his wives once, simply saying that she should have been above the gossip to begin with. Men and their impossible standards has been a thing since the BC era. But, so the gossip was highly, highly contagious, shall we say. So if I want to take down my political opponent, all I had to do was plant professional gossip mongers. Yes, that was a profession. Just like professional mourners were also a profession for funerals. You could hire extra mourners to make look like it was even a more big tragic event than it was. But I would plant my professional gossip mongers in the baths. I would perhaps even plant them in the markets. Give them a few weeks, tick 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 running their mouths, and I could watch my entire opponent come crashing down all because of a ruined reputation. By the time the Ostrogoths come and sack Rome in the 6th century AD, the baths are already out of use. Then like with everything else in Rome, all of this complex right here is slowly going to end up underground. The entire forum complexes were used for quite some time through the medieval times as a dumping ground, as a landfill, and they get completely filled up. Most of this area was simply famous as Campo Vaccino, field of cows. Cows and sheep were grazing on top of here. But in the early 20th century, between 1920 and 1930, we start the first excavation, rediscovering what these sites used to be. And that's when they were given the names of Trajan's Markets. Trajan's Markets are owned and run by the Commune of Rome, unlike the Roman forums that are run by the Superintendency of Archaeology. So it is a different site from your Colosseum ticket, and you get to get a separate ticket to enter from here. I highly recommend that you do go visit it, that, like many of our other excavations of ancient Rome, are active archaeological sites, but so they're all in the works to improve and make your visit easier. If you want to know more about all of this, subscribe to this channel, and if you want to experience a tour of the Trajan's markets when you come to Rome, just let me know. And thank you for watching. If you want to plan your own trip to Rome, reach out to me. Don't forget, if you dream it, me as your travel advisor, I will deliver it. Ciao!